Behind the Intelligence, Active and Passive AI. I'm Tanya Hall for ZDNet and Tech Republic, and joining me is Sarah Fay, Managing Director at Glasswing Ventures. Welcome, Sarah. Hi, Tanya. So, so what is Glasswing uh, Ventures known for? So Glasswing Ventures is a venture capital firm focused on early stage investments. We sit in the, in the Boston area and we are a pure play focused on uh, seed stage investments in AI tech companies. Um, we took the view uh, back in 2015 when it was you know, just an idea that uh, AI would be the next big wave of value creation and technology and we wanted to catch that wave and capitalize on it. Um, so we formed the firm, um, Rick Rennell and Rudina Ciceri are the founding and managing partners. I joined as the managing director. We've all worked together for a long time. Um, and then we established a group of advisors around us who are uh, influencers and thought leaders in AI. And uh, we closed the first uh, round in June of 2018 at 112 million. We're, we were happy with that. It takes a long time to raise, raise a first fund and we've made about 10 investments so far. You were on a panel at South by Southwest 2019 doing a deeper dive into artificial intelligence. In fact, the topic was behind the intelligence, active and passive AI. So let's start by defining what we mean by active and passive AI. Well, I think that there is a consciousness about AI where people understand when they are acting um, with it or using AI uh, with products such as Alexa or Siri, where you're where you're talking to something or um, where you're expecting something to happen, a self-driving car, uh, and and there's a general awareness, and then there's a passive AI that exists in our life too. Um, I was I was talking with uh, Esther Dyson, who's a, a famous um, technology reporter from from way back when, and she said the point of AI is to not be noticed, um, and the fact is that it can be working in the background, taking tasks and making them easier. So an example of that would be when you're on Facebook, and uh, Facebook asks you if you want to tag your friend in a photo. It already knows your friends name and AI is making that possible because uh, the algorithm has learned the names and it is identifying people by their faces which is nothing short of miraculous and it's just a tiny little task you know what the, for, for you the user to type in the person's name but it makes life a little bit easier by putting it there for you another example of that is um, you know as we're as we're typing now you know the text is filling in the next thing that it thinks we might like to say. AI is making that possible. It's taking data from, from what you in the past have, have uh, typed and what everyone is typing, and it's making pretty good guesses at the things that we might like to say or the things we might like to search for. I think of that as, as a, a, a passive use of AI. Now, in the, in the background, the business uh, people who are putting those AI functions in place are doing that actively. So, you know, you could, you can make a case for both sides. What is, what's the end user uh, interaction and, and what was the, the business reason for it and why did they put it in place? But that, I think that's, the, that's generally, I think that there's a higher bar when it's active AI, because when you're speaking to a device, you, you have a very high expectation that that it will be understood. Um, so, so uh, well, yeah, yeah, those are some excellent examples. In fact, you actually mentioned how China has become particularly proficient implementing AI powered chatbots and monitoring students' reactions to subject matter. What are some of the ingredients, if you will, that have pushed them ahead in this area? I'm I'm not sure if it's if it's just that um, they've tackled it in a different way from a business standpoint. You know, certainly they have um, some you know Tencent and uh, WeChat and some some really uh, famous technology companies, Alibaba that that are 
highly proficient in AI. And I think just because of the distance between us, they're applying it in lots of different ways. Like it's, you know, they're, they're just taking a different angle and they have different platforms and kind of play with it in different ways. But I'm, it could also be a cultural thing. I, I, I know that in China, um, people really do just gravitate toward um, the, you know, the, the avatars and, um, you know, ways to interact with technology and your computer. So they're, they're pre, maybe predisposed to accepting that and doing that. Um, it, I, I used the example of uh, the, the famous chatbot um, that Microsoft launched in the U.S. called Tay. Uh, and Tay was an experiment several years ago um, to, to allow a chatbot to be trained by people talking to it. And uh, so they set Tay loose in the environment, and the first words out of Tay's mouth was, was humans are really cool. And the idea was that people would talk with Tay and teach Tay culturally, you know, how to be like them. And apparently the first people who got a hold of Tay were neo-Nazis and they trained her to a adopt a different philosophy than was intended. And, you know, the last thing Tay said was Hitler was right and they took her down. <laughs> so that was over the course of, I think, a week. Um, but what a lot of people don't realize is that the very same algorithm that powered Tay was used to build a chatbot in China called Zhao Ice, uh, who today has 20 million followers and successfully interacts with all kinds of people on a daily basis. People talk to Tay, they tell Tay their secrets. Um, she is pleasant and provides conversation back. And, you know, I don't think they do it for any other reason than it's entertaining. But um, Zhao Ice is actually the same algorithm that was used for Tay. So Microsoft managed to create the biggest failure and the biggest success um, in, in the use of chatbots. Uh, but, but in China, um, chatbots are being used in all kinds of different ways. And it's not just a matter of how brands communicate with people or how even people communicate with people. It, it's about commerce. Um, WeChat does, I think it's something like a billion in commerce a month um, through uh, conversational commerce. And, and it's very much expected to reach the, the US or the Western culture. Um, and Facebook is after this in a very big way. I think that if you wanted to look at what Facebook's strategy is, you should probably take a really good look at uh, what, what WeChat is today. There are a lot of elements about that that they would like to adopt. So we're in the early phases. There are a lot of chatbot technologies. People are getting used to it. A lot of people don't like it as much as talking to a person, but some people like it better. So I think that as, as we get used to these things, you know, we'll know what to expect and it'll be, you know, a faster path to getting what we want. You also mentioned the importance of invisible AI, especially in online shopping. What do you see some of the best implementations for that? Well, I, I you know, I think that Instagram's got my number um, and uh, that's, uh, that's an example of a platform that's using AI to understand what images people respond to. It's, it's, it's what products, what images. It's really a big recommendation engine that just gets what you would likely respond to. And, you know, I, I've bought a ton of things off of Instagram and I'm really not that big a digital shopper, but they just get me that much. And I have to laugh too because it's so individual by person. My brother-in-law was saying, have you noticed the great grillware that, that Instagram is advertising? <laughs> and I think oh, that's, that's really just for you. <laughs> um, but, but so, you know, the, the, the personalization effect, you know, this is all going on in the background. We're, I think that, that users are probably more and more aware uh, that Instagram is good at understanding what they like. And they're, by the way, Instagram is not the only one doing this. All e-commerce providers right now are looking at ways to 
personalize the types of products that people see first because it's it's an automatic lift to, to ROI. Um, I recently met with a, a company or just chatted with a company called FindMine, which does a good job pairing the next likely thing you would buy when you're buying a product. Um, and there are all types of technologies like this. Um, I, I think I was also saying um, at the conference that um, one of the things that's making all of this possible, you know, certainly the algorithms have been a possibility for a long time. AI al algorithms have been in development since the 1980s. Um, but the chip power is, is now allowing us to crunch that much data um, to get to these types of answers quickly. Um, and I, I had a company in recently that, that had a, um, uh, uh, they, they have a, a platform that allows uh, the person who's never been to a site before to get the exact right pr product or the, the color of a product or whatever it is they would respond to just based on their social profiles. And so, you know, these guys, which just seems miraculous to me that without ever having touched a customer before, that an e-commerce site could guess the thing that they should first show them. And I asked these guys, you know, they, they said it, it added one five thousandth of a second to the experience. And I thought, okay, that's not too bad. What was it before? And they said it was a spinning wheel. You couldn't have done it before. The only reason you can do it now is because the chip power exists today to deliver that. Sarah Fay, Managing Director at Glasswing Ventures. If somebody wants to connect with you, Sarah, and find more, more about your work, um, how can they do that? Well, I'd love to hear from any startup in the AI uh, marketplace. And my contact uh, is sarah at glasswing.vc. Or you can look at our website at www.glasswing.vc. All right. Thanks again, Sarah. And if you guys want to find out more about me or find more of my interviews, you can do that right here on ZDNet or Tech Republic or go to my website, tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.